we're still learning about COVID-19. We know it came from an animal, but does that mean they also need the jab? Our furry friends can become carriers of the disease and in rare instances turn into a risk for owners. Safari parks, zoos and shelters have started inoculating apes, lions and wolves to protect us and the animals. The experimental vaccines are specifically made for them. Conservationists say we brought this on ourselves by our disrespect of nature, forcing animals ever closer to humans. A team of experts met for the first time this week to help develop a global plan to stop the spread of diseases from animals to humans. Meantime, Russia has developed the first coronavirus vaccine for animals, releasing an initial batch of 17,000 doses. Researchers in Finland and the US are working on similar jabs. This cat is a pioneer, albeit an unwilling one. Kesha the cat is one of the first recipients of the first ever COVID-19 vaccine for animals. His owners, Daniel and Elvira, say they signed up for the vaccination just to be on the safe side. Our cat goes outside a lot. Sometimes he doesn't even come home at night because he's doing his own thing, but he lives with us. So we're always concerned he could bring an infection home with him. We plan to start a family and heard that COVID could be dangerous for pregnant women. So it's better to be safe. It doesn't hurt the cat. The vaccine will provide these cats with immunity from the coronavirus for at least six months, according to the doctors here. Animals can show respiratory symptoms of the disease, problems breathing, a cough or a loss of their sense of smell. Essentially, the symptoms are the same as they are for people, just in a much, much lighter form. But it's not the symptoms themselves that are a concern here. The World Health Organization has warned that animals, including minks, could become carriers for the coronavirus and even pass it back to people. Last year, 17 million minks were culled in Denmark after some of them caught COVID-19. The Russian-made vaccine, called Carnivac Kov, could prevent that, according to developers. The country's veterinary and agricultural watchdog, Rosil Hoznadzor, began trials on rabbits, dogs, cats, foxes and other animals in October. Now they say the jab is ready for mass production. The vaccine was developed as a preventative measure, something aimed at the future, in case there are negative situations like the development of a mutation that can be passed between different types of animals. We shouldn't forget that any measures for disease prevention for animals prevent people getting sick as well, because around 70 percent of human diseases come from animals. The vaccine's developers say there has already been demand for the jab from businesses in several European countries, including in Germany. Rosel Hoznadzor recommends the vaccine for animals kept in close contact, including at fur farms and zoos. They say that for now, pets like these cats are very unlikely to become a risk to their owners. Thomas Mettenleiter is president of the Friedrich Löffler Institute. Aren't we taking things a little too far, Thomas, vaccinating animals, or is that the strategy that we may need to beat this pandemic? I think we have to define what animals we actually mean. Um, if we talk about pets, for example, I mean, um, pets get infected from their infected owners, but there is no single documented case that pets actually transfer the virus back to humans. The situation is different for fur producing animals, like for example, mink. Um, there, the infection in mink farms originates from humans, but then mink replicate the virus to a large extent and then are able indeed to reinfect humans. So there are documented cases in that aspect. When it comes to pets, how much of this is a money maker, would you say, and how much is essential? 
In terms of pets, I, I think, I mean, the, the, the prime procedure not to infect them is to keep a distance if you are infected yourself. So if you are, are in isolation, um, then keep away from your pets as much as possible. Um, I don't think there is an indication for vaccination of, of pets. In terms of fur producing animals, the situation is a little different. Um, there we have the possibility that the virus replicates, grows uh, in, the, in these farms to a very large extent. And this can suffice to then reinfect uh, humans. So um, vaccination in this particular setting might be one of the options. Of course, there are others and the, the preferred option for me at least would be vaccinate humans in the first place so that humans are not no longer posing a danger for animals, whether they are pets or whether they are fur producing animals. Um, in fur producing animals, we have seen a situation that the virus, because it, it replicates, it multiplies so much um, that variants uh, get selected. And some of these variants um, could at least theoretically indeed pose a problem. So there might also be an indication for vaccinating this kind of animals to avoid uh, this, the uh, appearance of these variants. And a good point there, we should think about the animals as well, of course. Um, a lot of farm animals, though, are already pumped with antibiotics to prevent the spread of diseases. And that's had all sorts of adverse effects on our health too. I mean, in, in the situation with farm animals uh, and, and COVID-19, um, there is no reason for concern as far as we can see. Um, livestock and poultry are to a large extent or absolutely resistant towards this virus. At least this is true for, for pigs and it's, it's true for chicken and ducks and, and turkeys. Uh, cattle show a very, very limited susceptibility, which also doesn't pose a problem at the moment. So, I mean, in, in terms of that uh, uh, kind of animal, uh, I think we are on the safe side. Thomas, intervening in nature in general got us into this mess in the first place. Couldn't more intervention increase risk? I mean, viruses are part of nature and the, the function of ecosystems. I mean, it's true, viruses are part of nature and humans are part of the animal kingdom in a shared environment. So basically, I mean, this is what biology is all about. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, there have been interventions in, in wild po wildlife populations uh, that were beneficial. Um, if you have a defined population and a defined pathogen, a defined infectious agent, uh, this could work. And examples are, for example, rabies, fox-mediated rabies, um, which has been eradicated in Central Europe by bait immunity of foxes. Um, uh, classical swine fever has been eradicated from wild boar also in Central Europe by bait immunization. And rinderpest has been eradicated globally. But I mean, these are special situations and uh, I fully agree. I don't think that vaccinating wildlife populations or any intervention in wildlife populations um, uh, gives, an, gives a, a better situation. Um, I think, I mean, it's more the change of human habits, uh, mm. which, is, which is required to avoid these spillover events. But even these spillover events that happen probably regularly are also part of nature. Well, you mentioned we should all get the jab. A lot of us are. Is there some other way we can change our behaviour to lower this risk? <sighs> I mean, it's difficult to define clearly the interface between wildlife and humans or, or livestock and humans, um, but definitely lowering um, risky contacts whatever they may be, is definitely one of the major measures of, of uh, a decrease in, in risk in general. Uh, this will also decrease uh, decrease the risk in these spillovers. Uh, that is has to do with direct contact with animals. It has to do with um, um, uh, going into wildlife habitats too strongly, interfering with wildlife populations, interfering with biodiversity. Uh, so this is a whole range of, of measures that actually need to be taken into account. Thomas Mettenleiter, President of the Friedrich Löffler Institute, thank you very much for being on the show today. You're very welcome. As far as vaccines for humans go, here's a good question for Derek Williams, our science correspondent. Can you mix doses of different vaccines? Circumstances have really kind of forced opinions to shift some on this issue. Um, to give you an idea, of how complex it's become. Let's look at the situation here in Germany. Um, until a few weeks ago, 
mixing and matching vaccines was pretty verboten here because the only safety and efficacy data that we had came from trials involving two dose regimens of the same vaccines. And because diverging from that would mean sailing into kind of uncharted waters, uh, then very rare cases of serious blood clotting events thought to be caused by the AstraZeneca vaccine began popping up in younger people. And, and that prompted authorities here to reevaluate recommendations for people under 60 who had already received a first dose of AstraZeneca. In them, for the second administered dose, the authorities now recommend using a messenger RNA vaccine like the one from Pfizer-BioNTech. A brand new Spanish study now indicates that that regimen is both safe and, and maybe even a lot more effective. But in the weeks before those results came in, the authorities had to make a choice. And they decided that one risk, uh, which in younger people is very rarely developing a serious blood clot after a second dose of AstraZeneca, that that outweighed the risk of mixing and matching vaccines. Um, in general, most experts seem to think that receiving a follow-up dose that's different from your first dose shouldn't really pose major problems. Still, um, health authorities are, are pretty conservative and they'll want really a lot of solid proof. Uh, a recent British study looking into some combinations indicated that, that mixing and matching, while apparently safe, also sometimes provokes more side effects than two doses of the same vaccine. Um, other studies looking at a range of different combinations are ongoing, and we, and we should know a lot more um, by this summer. Derek Williams there, I'm Ben Fazulin. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and see you again soon.